This podcast is for information purposes only, and it does not constitute medical advice. If you have any health or medical concerns, please contact your doctor or family physician. Welcome to Flexibility Focus, a podcast dedicated to communicating the science of flexibility training and coaching. I'm your host, Dan Van Zandt, and I want to wish you a very warm welcome to this, the fourth episode of the show. It's been a little while since I last uploaded any episodes, which I apologize for, but that was due to some ongoing technical issues which have now been resolved, so thank you for your patience. So far on the show, we've looked at what flexibility is from a biomechanical standpoint, which was explained in episode one. In episodes two and three, we examine some of the major physiological components that are affected by and which influence flexibility training, namely extensibility in episode two and stiffness in episode three. Episodes two and three form part of the mini series called The Components of Flexibility, which is continued in this episode. The physiological component that I'll be discussing today is that of elasticity, as well as two other complementary components, which are energy and hysteresis. Hello and welcome to part one. In this segment, I'm going to explain what elasticity, energy and hysteresis are. In previous episodes, I've explained that flexibility is the motor ability which determines the capacity of your joints to move. I've also explained that flexibility is made up of various components which determine the effect that training has on your soft tissues and ultimately they determine how much you can develop your flexibility. Those components are divided into different physiological dimensions. Those dimensions are length, tension, cross-sectional area and time. And each one of those dimensions can be divided further still into biomechanical properties which tell us about the physical behaviour of tissues when they're subjected to a stretching force. If you recall from a previous episode, I said that a property is simply something that can be measured and which describes what is happening in a physical system. A physical system is just a part of the universe that you've decided to look at and invariably, in flexibility training, that system will be the human body. The previous properties that we examined were extensibility, which comes under the physiological dimension of length. Extensibility is simply the amount that muscle fibres and connective tissues can lengthen or extend. We also examined stiffness and its reciprocal quality called compliance, which determine how much or how little tissues resist stretching respectively. Both stiffness and compliance come under the banner of tension. Elasticity, which we're looking at today, also falls into the category of tension-based properties. There are two other properties that I'll be discussing today, which are energy and hysteresis, and they too lie within the dimension of tension, and they are intimately connected to elasticity. So, what is elasticity? In simple terms, elasticity is the physical property that enables a tissue to return to its original shape or length once the stretching force is removed. Now, some authors use elasticity and stiffness interchangeably, meaning that they say elasticity is the amount that a material resists deformation. In the case of biological tissues, what they're saying is that elasticity is the muscle or connective tissue's resistance to stretch, but as I explained in the previous episode, we call a tissue's resistance to stretch stiffness, and stiffness is the amount of counterforce in the tissue. And a counterforce is simply the intrinsic force within the tissues that resists the external force. So an example of an external force would be a barbell pulling your upper body towards the floor in a Romanian deadlift, stretching your hamstrings in the process, and the intrinsic counterforce is the amount of tension generated in those hamstring tissues that resists the external pulling force of the barbell. Elasticity, however, is very different. It's the tissue's ability to return to its pre-stretch state upon cessation of the stretch. So in our Romanian deadlift example, elasticity is the ability of the hamstrings to return to their normal resting length when you lift your torso back up at the end of the repetition. Another way to think about it is to use a car as an example. Now, bear in mind, this is an extremely simplistic analogy, but it's one that's useful in illustrating the principles of these properties that we're talking about. So imagine that the muscle tendon unit, or MTU, is a car, and the car is stationary at the top of a hill. 
Gravity begins to pull the car down the hill, much like it pulls on tissues during a stretch. So we can think of gravity as the external force pulling on the MTU and stretching it. Stiffness then would be like applying the brakes, and it's the car's resistance to being moved. Elasticity, therefore, is like putting the car into reverse and returning it to its original position. Obviously, muscles and tendons are structurally and functionally nothing like cars, but that was just to give you an idea of how these different properties work relative to the object being subjected to the external force. Elasticity is also sometimes used interchangeably with the term extensibility, which was covered in episode 2, which was part 1 of this Components of Flexibility mini-series. To summarise, extensibility is how far your tissues can stretch, stiffness is how much your tissues resist the stretch, and elasticity is how well your tissues return to their original length once you stop stretching. Now, elasticity is an important component of not only flexibility, but also in terms of human movement as a whole, whether we're talking about general fitness or whether we're talking about achieving superior performances in competitive sport. But how does elasticity work? Well, think of a rubber band. And again, remember that this is a simple analogy used to help your understanding of the property's function. So don't take what I'm about to say literally to mean a muscle and tendon is like a rubber band. So elasticity tells us how a material will return to its resting length once the tensile load, aka the stretching force, is removed. So thinking about a rubber band, when you stretch a rubber band, it stores energy, which we call elastic potential energy. When you stop stretching the rubber band and the force holding it in the stretch position is removed, that elastic potential energy changes into kinetic energy. And you'll see that release of energy in the form of motion, i.e. a change in the position of the body the body in this case being the rubber band. We call this a passive process because if you remember from the very first episode, the word passive refers to the absence of voluntary effort. So this changing of energy from elastic potential energy to kinetic energy occurs without needing any direct input from you. And this elastic behavior of any material is represented by a physical law that was discovered by English physicist and chemist Robert Hooke, spelt H-O-O-K-E, who lived from 1635 to 1703, and he was the first person to see a microorganism. He coined the term cell, which we still use today to describe all the microscopic base units that make up the structure of the human body. And some people even say that he discovered gravity before Sir Isaac Newton, but we'll leave that debate for another time. Importantly for this podcast episode, Robert Hooke discovered the law of elasticity, which is named after him, and it's called Hooke's Law. Now, Hooke's law was first applied to springs, and it states that how a spring extends is directly proportional to the external load that is applied to it. And we can say that any material, including human tissues, obey this law for as long as the external load does not exceed the elastic limit. Now, if you remember from the episode on stiffness, when I talked about the different components of a stress-strain curve, the elastic limit is the point on the curve where the elastic region ends and the plastic region begins. The plastic region is the permanent deformation zone and the linear segment on a stress strain curve, which is the straight line that runs up at an incline before it tapers off into the plastic region, is called both the elastic region and the stiffness. So we can point to that part of the curve, the linear part, and say that it's both a measure of a tissue stiffness or its resistance to stretch. And it's also the elastic region where if the stretching force is removed at any point before the elastic limit, also known as the yield point, then the tissue will return to its pre-stretched length. So we can say that the human tissue that we're looking at on a stress-strain curve is exhibiting what we call Hookean behaviour, but only within the elastic region. But how is this useful to our understanding of movement and training? Well, in powerful or explosive movements like sprinting or jumping, the muscle tendon unit performs an eccentric contraction. If you remember in the last episode, an eccentric contraction occurs when the muscle lengthens while under tension. This eccentric contraction is very quickly followed by a concentric contraction or a shortening of the muscle while it's under tension. And we call this eccentric and concentric phenomenon the stretch shortening cycle or SSC for short. The stretch shortening cycle stores the elastic potential energy during the eccentric contraction and releases it during the concentric contraction. To give you an example of this in action, think about when you lift your heels off the ground, 
to rise up onto the balls of your feet or stand up on your tiptoes. You can generally increase the vertical distance from the ground to the top of your head by a couple of inches. Now compare this to when you perform a counter movement before you lift your heels. So when you flex or bend your hips, knees and ankles, your connective tissues, especially your Achilles tendons, store elastic potential energy. When you go to push your heels off the floor to jump, you harness this potential energy as it converts to kinetic energy, which propels you up into the air. Now, an important point that I want to make here is that when you go onto Google Images or you open up a textbook and you look at a stress strain curve, what you're looking at is a theoretical curve, which we use mostly just to illustrate the idea of a stress strain relationship. But human tissues do not typically behave like what you see on one of these theoretical stress strain curves because there are just so many variables that mean the behavior of tissues will be different from person to person. And those variables can include age, training experience, injury history, genetics, gender, and whichever specific tissues that we're looking at. To develop an accurate model of a specific person's stress strain curve, we would need elaborate laboratory equipment such as an ultrasound machine to determine how much deformation is occurring and a dynamometer which will tell us how much force is being exerted to deform those tissues. So just bear in mind when you see a stress strain curve, you're probably just looking at a theoretical example and that actual real life curves vary wildly from one person to another. And elasticity of tissues can be improved through training, for example, doing plyometric exercises. Another method, which you won't see often in the research literature because not many researchers utilize it or are willing to utilize it because of fears over the safety of ballistic stretching, but another method would be to develop your static range of motion, then develop the amount of dynamic motion you need within the limits of your static range of motion because static is always greater than dynamic, and then work towards doing ballistic stretching at the end of that dynamic range of motion. Interestingly, in 2014, Professor Julio Fernandez and his team of researchers at Columbia University used highly sensitive atomic force microscopes to detect a new form of mechanical memory, which adjusts the elasticity of muscles to their history of stretching. And what this means is that there is a chemical reaction that increases the elasticity of muscle proteins. It's a reaction that targets molecules which have been exposed to a stretching force. And so it's a way of fine tuning muscle elasticity and it may even lead to more novel methods of training and treatment in the future for musculoskeletal disorders and even heart disease. Uh, so far, we've looked at elasticity and we've also briefly covered energy, which on a stress strain curve would be the area underneath the elastic region. But what exactly is energy? In simple terms, energy is the capacity to do work. In physics, work is a product of force and displacement, so it's the amount of force required to make an object move. More specifically, we call this mechanical work because force is involved, and mechanics is the study of motion caused by force. Very simply, this means that when a force is applied to an object and the object moves or is moving, the mechanical work has been performed. Mechanical work is divided into two types, positive work, which is when the object is moving in the same direction as the applied force, and negative work, which is when the object is moving in the opposite direction from the applied force. An easy way to think about energy is that it's simply the currency that allows you to do things. So if you want to move your body, you need chemical energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate or ATP. If you want to move an external object, you need kinetic energy to be able to exert force on that object. Now, there are some cardinal rules to remember when it comes to energy. Firstly, you cannot do anything in the universe without energy. And secondly, any type of energy can be converted from one type to another. And in that conversion of energy, work is performed. Now, in biomechanics, we're primarily concerned with mechanical energy, which is the amount of energy that an object has either because it's moving or it's in a certain position or it's been deformed in response to stress. And there are three kinds of mechanical energy. Number one, kinetic energy, which is the energy in an object when the object is moving. Number two, gravitational potential energy or GPE, which is the energy in an object because the object is at a certain height above the ground. And number three, strain energy, which is the energy that an object has when it's deformed or when it changes shape in response to an imposed force. And 
These three types of mechanical energy all work in very simple ways. Kinetic energy is uh, in an object can perform work when it comes into physical contact with another object. So if you think of a boxer punching an opponent in the face, the kinetic energy in the boxer's fist performs work on the opponent's nose by displacing it to the other side of their face. GPE or gravitational potential energy performs work on an object when the object accelerates in a downwards direction towards the floor so it converts the GPE into kinetic energy. And strain energy performs work when an object returns to its original shape after the force which deformed it has been removed. So think back to our muscle example. A stretch causes the muscle to change length so it's been deformed and this stores energy in the tissues. Understand that the terms elastic potential energy and elastic strain energy are often used interchangeably. And this is because strain energy is a type of potential energy. So just bear that in mind that when you're reading research papers and they use different terms to describe what is essentially the same phenomenon. And that's pretty much all you need to know when it comes to the subject of energy in stretching and flexibility. Now, the last property that I'm going to discuss in this episode is hysteresis, spelt H-Y-S-T-E-R-E-S-I-S. Now, hysteresis can be summed up as the energy that is lost between the loading of tissue when the force is applied and the unloading of tissue when the force is removed, i.e. it's the energy that is lost when the tissue is stretched and when the stretch is released. So when you stretch, there's a difference between the amount of energy that you use to lengthen the tissues and the amount of energy that you use to return the tissues to their original length. And this is because your muscles and tendons are viscoelastic materials. And the word that physicists and engineers use to describe the energy lost by viscoelastic materials during loading and unloading is hysteresis. When we look at a stress strain curve, hysteresis is the part that tells us what happened in the elastic region before and after when the loading occurred. So if we're looking at the stress strain curve of a material that was 100% purely elastic, meaning that it stored 100% of the mechanical energy used to elongate the material, i.e. elastic potential energy, then when the stretching force is removed, the trajectory of the line on the curve would follow the exact same path during both loading and unloading. Again, this directly proportional relationship is described by Hooke's law, but the law doesn't describe what occurs in human tissues during loading and unloading because, again, human tissues are a viscoelastic material. This means that the ratio between stress and strain changes from loading to unloading. In a tendon, for example, more force and thus more stress is required to stretch the tendon during loading than is required to de-stretch it during unloading. And what this looks like on a stress strain curve is a type of loop where the loading portion of the curve rises up and the unloading portion of the, cu- of the curve swoops back down underneath the upwards loading curve. Now, we already know from the universal law of conservation of energy that energy cannot be created or destroyed, not in this universe at least. So what happens to the energy lost during the unloading phase? Well, the potential energy that was stored in the tissues during stretching and which didn't convert to kinetic energy when the stretch was released was converted to thermal energy and it was lost as heat. On the stress strain curve, this is represented by the area between the upper loading curve and the lower unloading curve on the hysteresis loop. And this area between the two curves is the energy lost as heat And it's important because it tells us how efficient the tissue is at storing potential energy. And it's an indication of how elastic the tissue is. So if the area between the two curves is narrow, this tells us that the tissue has lost lost less energy as heat and therefore it's stored more elastic potential energy. Therefore, we can say it's a more efficient tissue. Conversely, if the area between the two curves is quite large, so we have quite a significant loop, This tells us that the tissue has lost more energy as heat and therefore it's stored less elastic potential energy. So we can say that it is a less efficient tissue. And again, this efficiency can be improved by training methods that increase elasticity, such as plyometrics. And that is elasticity, energy and hysteresis in a nutshell. Welcome to part two.
This question is from Sarah, and she says, I've been a physiotherapist for less than a year, but one of the areas I'm really struggling with is asking questions that draw enough information from the patient during the initial consultation that I then have difficulty setting good goals for treatment. I'm having to rely on more experienced physios to ask the questions just so I can get the information I need. Please help. Thanks for your question, Sarah. Firstly, don't beat yourself up just because you don't yet know how to ask the right questions. Optimal questioning, especially in a clinical environment, is something of an art form that comes with experience. And unfortunately, university courses, especially physiotherapy degrees, tend to show you what to do in terms of orthopedic assessments and manual therapy techniques, but they tend to fall short when it comes to giving you what you need to know in terms of talking to patients. But I think it's great that you've asked for help from your more experienced colleagues and don't feel like you're being a burden to them. At the end of the day, you're all on the same team. What I'll do here is share with you some of the mistakes I've made over the years, which I've learned from and which I use to direct my own questioning sessions with, with my clients. So the first thing to do is to avoid asking closed questions. A closed question is one which warrants only a yes or a no answer. And an open question is one in which the patient needs to, to provide more detail in order to give you an answer. The two main benefits of asking open questions is that they allow the patient to steer the direction of the conversation and they also get the patient to think more by giving longer answers. Now, most patients will give you the very occasional longer answer to closed questions, but if you ask too many closed questions in a row, then the patient is probably going to is probably going to clam up, which isn't what you want when you're trying to build rapport, trust and buy-in. So what should you do? Well, very simply, convert your closed questions into open questions. Uh, it sounds simple, but it will take some practice, but you need to become aware of what you're asking. If you're already in the process of asking a question and you catch yourself before you've finished asking it, and you realize that you're asking a closed question, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with stopping and rephrasing the question. At the end of the day, you're a physiotherapist, not a public speaker. So it's okay to realize you're asking the wrong type of question stopping and then re-asking the question in a different way. And you'll know you're asking a closed question because it can be answered by a simple yes or no. So let's look at an, at an example. So if you ask the client, can you move without pain? They could easily answer by just saying yes or no. So then you could restate the question, this time starting the question with either the word what or how. So your rephrased question would look like, what movements can you do without pain or how much can you move without pain? And the second mistake is thinking that there's such a thing as a one true question. It's that holy grail of a question which will give you everything you need to know about the patient or how to help them. Such questions do not exist. The key to teasing more information out of the patient is when you hear what you think is a key bit of information and which you want to know more about, say things like, tell me more or what else can you tell me about that? And you keep these probing questions short and to the point so you avoid interrupting the patient's thought process. Um, once you've got the hang of that, you can evolve your questioning by picking out the most significant things the client has said, repeating their exact words and then expanding on it. So say, for example, your patient has said they feel a slight twinge in their knee when they walk downstairs. After they finish talking, you could say something like, you said that you feel a slight twinge in your knee when you walk downstairs. Tell me more about that. And you can vary this question by, instead of saying, tell me more about that, you could say, say more about that, or expand on that, or what's going on there? And that way you can repeat this technique again and again without sounding repetitive, and it's a great way to keep the focus on the patient. Another mistake to avoid, and it's one that I've made lots of times, is rambling on when asking questions. And this is really a variation of looking for that one true question. And I couldn't stop myself from asking the same question in three or four different ways while stringing together five different potential answers along the way and by the time I finished speaking the patient was so confused about what to say that they just sit there looking at me blankly really unsure about what they were supposed to say. So the answer here is to think then talk and don't be afraid to allow a moment or two of silence while you formulate the question. You see humans seem to have this natural tendency to be uncomfortable with silence which makes us jump in before we're actually ready to ask the question but what you'll generally find is that when you start allowing it for a little bit of silence, the patient will continue to process without you needing to ask any questions at all. And in that moment of silence, while you're thinking, 
the patient might suddenly remember something important and they'll likely volunteer the information to you. And oftentimes it can be the key piece of the puzzle that you were, you were thinking of, of asking about. And another reason that people have a tendency to ramble is because they're worried that the patient didn't grasp the question. And this happens because we're in telling mode rather than asking mode. And it arises from our innate need to be understood. And so we project that need onto the patient and we end up leading them down a particular path. So the strategy that I found most effective here is to let go of my agenda, ask the question once, stop and see where the client chooses to take the conversation. And I found that often the most exciting moments during my interactions with patients happened when the patient didn't actually understand what I was asking for and it produced some real light bulb moments for both them and myself. Uh, I hope that answer helps. Uh, be sure to get in touch again in the future and let me know how you get on. I'd be really interested to hear how your questioning evolves over time. Okay, folks, that's it for this episode. Until next time, stay safe and stay flexible.